Thank you. I'll try to maybe make the talk short so that the food can, we have enough time for that. So I have 27 slides. I told myself I'll try to not go on and on too much about each slide, but uh, then maybe during the discussion period we can come, come, uh, come back to it. I also want to st start by saying uh, that I am a neuroscientist. I'm an Evo Devo neurobiologist. I usually work on bird brains. So when I get an invitation from an anthropology department, I never quite know what to do. Uh, so I, I asked if it was OK if I didn't talk about my own research, because I didn't want to have everyone fall asleep. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about human brains and what's special about human brains. But I also, I, I'll try not to be too insecure about it, but there will be people in the room who know much more about some of these topics than I do. But that's OK. Uh, we can have that have it in the discussion. Um, I'll talk, I'll begin with a, a fair bit of history, sort of a history of, of how people have thought about human uniqueness, and particularly the, the human brain, how unique it is. Uh, talk a little bit about unique, some people think there's a unique type of uh, uh, neuron in, in great ape brains. Then I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about brain size, how has human brain size changed. Uh, and I'll talk about the neocortex, how it is enlarged disproportionately. So we really don't really have scaled up rat brains. We have uh, some parts of our brain are much larger proportionally. And in the end, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the limits. Have we reached the limits, so to speak, of the human brain size? Or maybe a better way to put this is what are some of the downsides of expanding the brain uh, if we were to expand it beyond the current limits? I'd like to start off with this particular picture here from Andreas Vesalius. Uh, just because I, I think it's kind of cool that to be contemplating your own skull in 1543, uh, and I think that's a little bit what we, what I'd like to do today is contemplating our own brains. Of, uh, but I want to start with this a little bit. I just I wanted to know how many of you have heard of the triune brain theory? Okay, it's an extremely <coughs> well popularized uh, theory that was originally proposed by Paul McLean, who built on some earlier ideas. And then Carl Sagan had a heavy hand in uh, promoting it. That's probably where a lot of it came from. Uh, the basic idea is that the human brain has inside it a, a, a core that uh, sometimes called the R complex or the reptilian brain that is involved in things like self-preservation, aggression, all the, the sort of primitive instincts. And then ma mammals have around it a, a shell-like here, the yellow structure, uh, that some people call the limbic system. That is more has to do with sort of the, uh, uh, higher emotions, things like love, parental care, mammals, you know, being uh, uh, having uh, taking care of their babies a lot more maybe than reptiles. And then outside of that, you have a third layer, which would be the uh, neocortex, or as you put it here, the rational brain. Uh, and that is supposed to be uh, what makes us rational. Now, there, I, personally, I hate this theory. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the, there are many problems. You know, one of them is I study birds. I mean, parental care is not unique to mammals. You know, and, and, I, and I have aquarium fish, and parental care is not, you know, plenty of fish with parental care and so forth. It's also clear that the neocortex is not something limited to great apes. If rat has a neocortex. In fact, homologs of neocortex exist in pretty much all vertebrates. So, uh, but it's an amazingly popular and appealing idea. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, go back a little bit, step back, and say, well, where does this appeal come from, and how did we get here? Uh, and, uh, it's, it's interesting, I think, that you can trace the idea all the way back to Plato, which is just kind of a fun thing to do, the, this idea of the tripartite soul, that uh, you have an appetitive soul, a spirited soul, and then a rational soul. Um, and uh, you, you know, I don't read the original Plato, right? Uh, uh, maybe some of you here do. But uh, it's, you ask, why did he come up with that? And that's kind of interesting. He sort of takes, starts with the idea that, well, uh, you know, sometimes we have inner conflicts. We're fighting when we have competing impulses. And, and that can't be if you just have one soul, because one soul can't fight with itself. So you need multiple souls. And so that's where the idea really comes 
comes from. And that's something we can all relate to, is the idea that, yeah, sometimes you do have to fight with yourself. Am I going to have that cookie now, or am I, you know, uh, am I going to wait? And it's, it's hard to overstate the influence that this idea has. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, you can maybe try to see it in, the, in Freud's, you know, ego, id, and superego. And you can see it in popular culture, too. I mean, this was kind of funny to me. But I mean, that's almost perfectly mapped. The Wizard of Oz uh, almost perfectly maps onto Plato's uh, idea. And I'm sure somebody did that intentionally. It's just that most of us never realized. Um, OK, now Plato's idea weren't really comparative. He didn't really talk about like who's got what kind of soul. But his student, Aristotle, was a biologist. Uh, at least I think of him that way. And he, he changed the terminology a little bit. He had a vegetative soul that was you know, in all life forms and a sensitive soul that was in all animals. And then the rational soul, he said, that's only for humans. Okay, that's where, and that's intellect, basically, uh, is, is what you have there. So that's a, a compared, sort of taking Plato's idea and putting him into a comparative biological context and real, sort of stating that there's a, a nested hierarchy of souls, if you will, that we have all three. Uh, most animals have only two of them, and plants only have the vegetative soul. Aristotle's idea on, you know, were these immaterial souls, were their material souls are very complicated. Uh, we could talk about that. But most of us uh, know when we think of souls, we very quickly go to Descartes and uh, sort of the Cartesian dualism that many of us heard about, uh, have heard about. And so that was mid-1600s. Uh, and um, what's interesting is what Descartes did with the Aristotelian souls is he basically said, look, the, the two lower souls, the vegetative and the sensitive soul, we don't need anything immaterial for that. We can have machines that can do this. Uh, and they had very, in Descartes' time, they already had very complex sort of water fountains and very complicated machines, mainly hydraulic driven uh, machines with switches and, and pumps and so forth. He said, we can, we can do that. But rational, uh, the rational soul, the intellect, the thinking, that you, you can't do with machines. So that has to be some immaterial soul. And then now you have the problem of you have these material souls, uh, the machines, and you have an immaterial soul. How are they supposed to be united? And that's where the pineal gland comes in. It's not so much that it was the seat of the soul. It was really the, the interface between the immaterial soul and the material souls. And we can talk about exactly why, why, why that is. But that's part of I don't want to talk about it too much. But it's, it's a fascinating story how exactly he thought that would work. Um, Interesting aspect of Descartes is that he, he had the rational soul for him was immaterial one, but it, it, it encompassed a lot of things, so including feelings and emotions and, and the ability to suffer and love and feel. That for him was still part of the, the rational soul. So it wasn't just pure intellect. And that becomes important in the context of animal welfare. People who were real Cartesians, you know, they had no problem, you know, sort of sticking a pig and it screams, but it's OK. It's like, like breaking a watch. You know, it's not, you know, it might make some funny noise, but it's not going to suffer or, or feel pain or anything, because they don't have the rational soul. Just a few years later, they were, in fact, they were contemporaries. And as far as I can tell, they knew each other. It was Thomas Willis and Descartes. Uh, so Willis was in, in England. And maybe some of you have medical training. You might have heard of the t circle of Willis. It's a circle of arteries at the base of the brain where it's a nice invention if you have a complete one. Because if you get one of these arteries blocked, then the blood can circulate around that blockage and, and still provide your brain with blood. And he discovered that. Uh, part of why he discovered that is that he did actual dissections of human brains. A lot of people before him. You know, they didn't really work with human brains. And he uh, worked with human brains, a lot of human brains. But he also worked with a lot of other brains. Uh, so there's a little quote here. He was, I would consider him one of the first comparative neuro neuroanatomists. He just dissected everything. He had a small group of people around him. And, and any of you who are into um, architecture, he, his brain drawings were done by Christopher Wren, who I think believe is uh, Britain's most famous architect. Uh, and it was quite, quite. Uh, Quite elegant. So he did a lot of 
dissections, like I said, from lobsters to monkeys. Uh, and what he was struck by is that, at least within the primates, human brains look quite similar to those of other primates. That is, humans weren't these outlier brains. Uh, they were very, diff uh, very similar to other brains in many ways. And he argues that, well, based on that anatomical similarity, I don't see how there can be this vast difference in souls. Uh, between monkeys and humans. He said, basically, they're, 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 the anatomy is so similar that, and I think he also knew behavior a little bit better than, than Descartes. In fact, he didn't have a lot of respect. He said Descartes was a shitty anatomist. <laughs> and it's true, I mean, he never dissected brains, really, but I think he was also, Willis was also a better student on animal behavior, uh, horses and dogs. He kind of knew that these animals were capable of feeling, uh, 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 sensation, perception, a lot of things that your typical watch doesn't do. Uh, and so he, he did several things. One, one of them is he said, OK, this rational soul, I still believe that humans have a unique rational soul. It's just it really is a very limited thing. He called it reflective thought, judgment, and will. That's what we have that horses, dogs, other animals don't have. OK? Uh, so he had a restricted idea of the rational soul, and then in, and that's different from Descartes. And then in terms of where to localize that, he said, okay, the pineal is a stupid place to put that. <laughs> uh, but what he said is, okay, um, he said the interface is basically at the corpus callosum. So let me show the next slide. It, you can think of the brain as as a bunch of sensory pathways. Uh, that are coming up through the thalamus, and then here through this uh, this cutaway here, you can see the, the striatum, the, the basal ganglia. He basically said, look, they sort of seem like a lens, and the information is coming up and is projected through this lens onto the overlying cortex. And underneath the cortex is that corpus callosum and the adjacent white matter. And he basically said, is 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 the these the lower souls are projecting this information, even though they probably didn't think of information the way we did today, but the, these, these impress, sensory impressions are projected up to that. And then the reflective soul, this immaterial thing, is basically looking at that screen of information and, and is, is reflecting on that. So I think it's just kind of interesting. Uh, so there was still immaterial. There were these an immaterial rational soul, and there were these material things. That went away, at least within the, the, the neuroscience community. Uh, I think one of the first people to really say, no, it's all material, was, was Hobbes, actually. Uh, I remember reading Leviathan. Uh, I didn't know that uh, Hobbes was uh, one of the first full-blown materialists. Uh, certainly by the time you get to Darwin and Huxley and his contemporaries, they really didn't talk about rational souls as immaterial things anymore. But the basic question that they were or they were still interested in the same basic question, which is how are humans unique? We sort of think that we're unique behaviorally. Well, what is the biological basis for that uniqueness? And they looked at the brain. And Darwin didn't have a whole lot to say about it. Most of that was, was uh, his, uh, his bulldog, people sometimes call him, uh, T.H. Huxley, uh, really was uh, or became a, a neuroanatomist, a comparative neuroanatomist. And he had a very famous argument with Richard Owen, who was a uh, senior uh, statesman at the time and a sort of a, a guardian against Darwinism. And, and uh, actually, I have a lot of respect for Owen when you read carefully. He was a pretty careful thinker. Uh, but for purposes here, we could sort of say they had this, this fierce debate. And basically, the idea was that Owen said, look, the human brain is really quite unique uh, compared to other primate brains. And they didn't know a lot about these other primate brains. Like gorillas were just starting to come in on ships from Africa and so forth. Uh, uh, and Owen, I think, was one of the first people to, to actually look at one of those brains. And he said that there, there are some unique features about the human brain. And they have to do like with this hippocampus minor, which is a ridge. And when you look down into the lateral ventricle, there's a little ridge there. So it's not the hippocampus the way we think of it, but it is a, a little ridge called the hippocampus minor. Uh, he also said that only, and he said that was unique to humans, uh, the, the uh, 
curved posterior horn, he said, was of the lateral ventricle, he said, was unique to humans. And then in general, this, when you look down on a human brain, he said, only in humans do you have a posterior lobe that is so big that it covers the cerebellum. And he said, based on that, I'm going to take humans out of my taxonomy and put them in a special, special uh, order. And, and um, Huxley said, no, you're wrong. And this is, this is my opportunity to make a name for myself. And I'm going to uh, enlist a lot of friends. He, ha he even founded his own journal where a lot of his friends published. And it was a very interesting experiment in sort of like sociology of science. Uh, but uh, Huxley won this fight. Uh, he basically showed that chimpanzees and other, other uh, primates have all these three features. It's interesting, he got a lot of press at the time, too. It was in the popular press, there was a big debate about it. Um, OK, so the problem then for Huxley was he basically said, look, human brains are just like chimpanzee brains. But he also kind of knew that behaviorally and psychologically, it was probably a big difference. And so he struggled with that. Uh, he was the one, how many people in the room, no, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, how many people think are agnostics? And my son very proudly proclaims, I'm an agnostic, Dad. Uh, he came up with the word agnosticism, and I think, so he didn't want to be a dualist like Descartes, but he didn't really know how to solve this problem. And when you, in, in some places he says, look, there must be some small thing in the brain, in the human brain, that is special, that gives us these abilities. Uh, language, of course, is a big part. But that, that's, again, is a behavioral trait. What gives us language? So you thought that must be some relatively small thing. But he had no idea what it is. I should also say, just quickly, Huxley, in, in emphasizing how similar <laughs> brains are, he ignored the size dimensions. So these are actually his figures. And you can see the chimp brain, he, he presents it as if it were the same size as the human brain, which is, is interesting. We'll come back to that. But what I want to do now is sort of shift into the modern age uh, and talk about one example of uh, uh, where people have argued that maybe there is some really small thing that is special about the human brain. And that is this particular kind of neuron that is sometimes called a von Kahneman neuron or spindle cells. And uh, the, uh, it was a, the, the first sort of big paper on this. They're called von Kahneman neurons because technically they were first described by, by, I forget his first name, I think Conrad or Ferdinand or something like that, von Kahneman. Uh, and, but the, 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 uh, the first modern paper was by Nimczynski and John Allman down at Caltech. You might have, you might, some of you may, have, may know of him. Uh, uh, did a, a big comparative study where they said there are that, that uh, this particular type of neuron, is, these are spindle-shaped cells. So I actually had to look up, what is a spindle you know, nowadays? Who, who's, who knows what a spindle is anymore? I mean, I know what a spindle-shaped neuron is, basically elongate cell body and then single processes like that. Uh, um, and they said, you find these in humans and other great apes, and we don't find them outside of great apes, these spindle cells of von Kahneman neurons. Now, you don't find them everywhere in the cortex. They're just in a particular part of the brain. And particularly, they're in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex which, cortex, which is part of the medial prefrontal cortex. And uh, they thought this was, this was cool. And it is, is pretty cool. The question is, well, what, you know, how, because there aren't many uniquely human features. If, and OK, this is not uniquely human, but it's limited to the great apes. There aren't that many features in the, in the human brain that we know of that are in the great ape brains that are uh, limited to great apes. The question is, what, what do these neurons do? So John Allman uh, mapped them out. And this is a much more recent study from 2011. Uh, and he, in this particular paper, they showed that it's not just the anterior cingulate cortex. They're also found in this part of the brain. It's called the anterior insula. So that, you know, you've heard of these lobes, right? The human brain has these different lobes. Well, there's sort of a underneath the temporal lobe. If you pull, pry open, and you look down there, you can see a little island, an insula that is it's not really a lobe, but it's sometimes called a lobe. And, and uh, the anterior part of it. Uh, has a lot of these spindle cells in humans, gorillas, chimpanzees, but uh, uh, according to Allman, not, not in a lot of other species. And, you, and the interesting thing is when you look at what activates the anterior insula or the anterior cingulate cortex, these are interesting 
situations in which they become active. Things like when you have an aha moment in some test, you get to have some insight. Oh, I get it. That would activate your anterior cingulate cortex or the uh, anterior insula. So that's why um, they'll say things like the, the, uh, these, these areas are involved in empathy, social awareness, self-control. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical of these things because it's, it's the anterior cingulate actually is involved. You know, almost every fMRI study, the anterior cingulate cortex will be involved if the task is difficult enough. And, and uh, but just for for the just to present the argument, uh, there's the the argument was that it's not just these areas that are doing something special; it's the spindle cells within those areas. They're very large, and they are supposed to project this a high experience to a large part of the brain very quickly and so light up the entire brain. Oh. Interesting idea. It's a controversial idea. And I think from a comparative perspective, one of the things that makes it controversial but also interesting is that people soon after the original report just, uh, in 1999 by Nimchinsky that said it's, these, these neurons are limited to the um, anterior single cortex, they said, well, we looked at elephants. They're there in elephants in anterior cingulate and insula. And we looked at, well, dolphins didn't have it. But whales, OK, these, these baleen whales, a humpback whale. So this is actually from a study where they looked at the, the uh, cortex of baleen whales. You can see these spindle-like cells, again, in the anterior cingulate and the, and the uh, uh, anterior insula. So that was OK in some way. We, we all, you know, it's not too hard to accept that an elephant and a whale, maybe they're as smart and, and capable of empathy and social complexity and awareness maybe even as, uh, as we are. So that's OK. Last few years, though, or this is very recent, was I think this summer, macaques also have these uh, neurons. And I'm not so familiar with all the evidence, but Rudolf Neuenhuis is a very well-respected authority. I would take his word for it. And then he says, uh, also in uh, prosimians, pygmy hop hippopotamus, the walrus, and the manatee. Okay, So now, you know, from a comparative perspective, this is the plausibility argument that these are, these are, these, these are these, these, that these neurons are what makes us special. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't see it happening. I mean, there are also neurological reasons. That I, I've always been skeptical that that one type of neuron is somehow going to give you this magic spark that is going to make you uh, aware. But you know, I don't have a much better explanation. So I, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's. The point here was to say that this is one example where people have looked for this what Huxley would have been excited about, some small thing. Because everything is, is, is the same, you got to look for some small thing. So now let me pivot to the other end of the spectrum where we, let's say, look at size. Because I think brain size is an important thing that Huxley is sort of underestimated. And if you look at our brains, there are three to four times as big as that of a chimpanzee. And uh, personally, at least, I think that that probably is, is something important. Now here's where I get a little clammy and a little insecure. I don't know how much, how, you know, who's in the audience here. I know very little about fossils and, and uh, uh, about endocasts and so forth. And every time I try to read about it, it it's very complicated. And, and uh, endocranial volume, I mean, so you all know that in, in fossils, you can't get brain data, of course, but you can get endocranial data. And that, you know, is probably pretty good, at least for our species, uh, uh, for our for hominids, it's probably a fairly good indication of brain volume. What I've done here is sort of graph it uh, accord, according to millions of years before present endocranial volume. And the only thing I really want to make with this point, uh, with this graph, is, is to show that there were probably two periods of time when there were fairly dramatic increases in absolute brain size. One was right around the time of the origin of the genus Homo. And we don't really know. Was this a, a sudden burst, or was this a million years? We don't really know. It's hard to date these things. But then there was a relatively long period of stasis. I think Homo erectus, most people would agree that there wasn't a whole lot of uh, increase in brain size at that time. But then there was a second burst when, uh, within the last 200,000 years or so as, as uh, Homo sapiens evolved. 
<coughs> so we can try to interpret that. I'm not going to, especially for this audience, I'm not going to try to say too much about what drove these changes. But I will, I do want to uh, focus a little bit on, on um, how these relate to changes in body size, because that's something we, that, that is often neglected. I, I was, since I wasn't trained as an anthropologist, I was kind of shocked to realize how much taller uh, Homo erectus and early Homo sapiens were compared to Australopithecines. And I understand that Lucy was a small individual, uh, but the changes, differences in body size were really quite significant. So uh, the point here is that, that when you had the origin, uh, at the origin of the genus Homo, there was not just a large increase in brain size, there was a, a, quite a significant increase in body size as well. In contrast, the second burst of human brain expansion was accompanied by a much smaller increase in body size. And then during the last uh, uh, however many, you know, 100,000 years, it was probably even a decrease in body size, certainly body weight. So that to me is interesting. We can ask, what does that tell us about the, the, the selective pressures that are driving these things? Uh, I am not sure. I think there are probably many answers to these things. But I, I always like the idea, and maybe we can discuss this further in the discussion period, that the second burst was probably driven by intraspecific competition, uh, sort of between groups, some sort of Machiavellian uh, intelligence, social intelligence kind of thing. Whereas this was probably more related to things like you know being able to, to uh, move over greater distances, exp uh, forage, for, forage, forage further, uh, have a larger body size, be able to defend yourself better, get at new kinds of uh, resources, uh, that kind of thing. But like I said, I really don't know. Uh, OK, so that's within the hominids. And I really don't know much about fossils. I know more about sort of living extant brains and what they look like. And so I'm going to now sort of open the focus a little bit and talk about primate brains more generally. So here are just uh, prosimian brain, marmoset brain, macaque, gibbon, and human brain, uh, all drawn to the same sort of overall dimensions. You can see the scale bars, right? There's a dramatic increase in size as you get closer and closer to humans. So this is one of the things that always intrigues me. I mean, as growing up, I learned about morphoclines and so forth that you find sometimes in certain lineages, things really steadily sort of become different. Uh, it, to me, it's interesting that it wouldn't have to be this way, that as you get closer and closer to humans in the phylogenetic tree, the brain size keeps going up and up. Body size also, but uh, brain size in particular. So that's interesting. You also notice that the convolutions, the convolutedness gets more. Uh, I don't think that has any tremendous functional significance. Uh, and I'm actually very interested in folding, but you can ask me about that in the discussion period. Instead, what I want to talk about now is a little bit about you know, this, this increase in brain size, and this is absolute brain size, and ask, well, th what does that mean about neurons? Are these, do, did we increase neuron numbers? right? Or do, it could be that our brain is, yeah, it's, much, it's three times as big as that of a chimpanzee, but that's because our neurons are three times as big, and really we don't have any more neurons. Or are the neurons the same size, but uh, we have a lot more of them. So it's not that easy to count neurons, even nowadays where we have these. How many of you here have ever done stereology, where you have these very rigid protocols okay, to count these open sections? It's a very tedious process. And of course, there are different densities of neurons in different parts of the brain. And so sampling is complicated, and it's not so easy. But there was, uh, in the last few years, Susanna Herculano Hauzel down in, in Brazil has uh, developed a fairly clever technique that some people hate, but I think it's a clever technique anyway. She calls it uh, by the fancy name of the isotropic fractionator method for counting neurons. She basically takes a fixed brain, she puts it in a blender with some ingredients, and she basically extracts the cell nuclei. And then she has a soup of cell nuclei, and she puts, she, she homogenizes them, takes a little sample, and she counts cell nuclei in a, like, like the way you do a blood cell count in a hematocrit or something like that. Um, and then she can use also antibodies that recognize neurons 
versus the nuclei of neurons versus the nuclei of other cells. So she can actually estimate how many neurons there are in a brain uh, and uh, how many non-neurons, most of them presumably glial cells. And so here is uh, one of the early studies. She did this in uh, a bunch of different rodents. In Brazil, they have these capybaras, which are these nice big rodents, fairly big brains. And she also did it in a bunch of uh, um, primates. Uh, and to me, the most interesting thing about her findings are that within rodents, you have a pretty good scaling rule. So the number of neurons goes up fairly predictably with the brain mass. Okay, this may be not surprising, right? When you, as you make a bigger rodent brain, you do it by adding more and more neurons. What was interesting is that in primates, they also have a scaling rule, but it's a different scaling rule. So basically, the way you can think of it is, as you go to bigger and bigger primate brains, you add more neurons per extra unit mass than you would in a, in a rodent brain. And that probably means the neurons, that primate neurons, as you get to large primate brains, they're actually smaller than they would be in an equivalent. Like a capybara would have bigger neurons than a primate of the same brain size. So that's kind of interesting. I, I really like scaling rules because one of the things I've never liked about comparative neuroanatomy is that it seems so, you know, everything is chance and you really have to write it, you know, you're just writing an encyclopedia. The species is like that, the species is like that. I, like, I wanted some science in there, I wanted some rules. And so I was naturally attracted to scaling rules. But this is kind of cool because it also says your general principles and rules, they can be changed as evolution sort of does its thing. That's, that's okay, I'm okay with that. Um, and in fact, that's very interesting. OK, so you notice here there's no human on here. So what do you think would happen if we ground up a human brain and counted how many neurons? Would they fall on the rodent line or on the primate line? All right. They fall very nicely on the, on the primate line. So these are just part of the primate data. Uh, and here what they've done is they, um, they looked separately at the cerebellum, the neocortex, and the rest of the brain. So if you're going to make soup, you know, at least maybe make three different soups, you know, because some people really have a trouble with her just grinding up these, especially like a gorilla brain. It's like these precious animals and you have all this wonderful histology and you're just grinding them up and making soup. <laughs> okay, so um, usually they just get to work on one hemisphere and the other one will section and stuff like that. But it, she has been able to gather a lot of data in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, in terms of the numbers, just sort of an interesting thing is a lot of people uh, like to say the human brain has about 100 billion neurons. It's probably closer to 86 billion neurons, which is still a lot of neurons. Uh, although, you know, a difference of 14 billion is not nothing. 80% of our neurons are in the cerebellum, which is always kind of interesting. Uh, uh, don't know really what to make of that. Most of those neurons are really tiny granule cells. And, uh, okay. Um, really just that these are the cerebellar data points. These are the neocortex data points. Those are all primates. Those are all primates, yeah. Beautiful. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Probably um, so part of what I want to say here is now I'm going to, for most of what I've talked about, I've talked about the, sort of the whole brain. But now we're going to start breaking it up into different parts and see how they scale. And here already you can see that the human neocortex scales like it should for primate neocortex. Mm -hmm. And what is that scaling rule for a neocortex? If you've ever looked at a chimpanzee brain, or a human brain, and a chimpanzee brain, macaque, lemur, which is a prosimian kind of brain, I don't need to tell you. But um, a, lot of, a lot of places where I talk, I do need to explain what a lemur is. Uh, um, what you notice right away is that the, the ratio of red to other colors is a lot lower in the, in the lemur. And here, this is sort of graphed out here, the ratio of the neocortex to medulla. Okay, how much bigger is the neocortex than the medulla is quite, you know, the human neocortex is about 100 times bigger than the medulla, human medulla. Whereas you look in a, in a tree shoe or a, or a marmoset, the ratio is, I think, about 5 to 10. Okay, so that, to me, that is a very big difference. What it means functionally, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to now. We're not sure. But I think when I talk to neuroscientists, you know, who work on rats, I always try to you know, 
remember that you know your rat neocortex is this tiny little thing. If you go to a human, it's this. You know, most of the brain is neocortex. What what does that mean? What's the significance of that? Uh, most of the time, they've never even thought about that. Um, one idea I, I've had, it's not original to me, but I think it, I've highlighted it, um, is that when you make one structure much larger than the other structures, disproportionately large, you change the proportions, that might affect the connections of that structure with the rest of the brain. I don't have really strong evidence for that. Most of the evidence is rather correlative. But think about it this way. If, if, if in development, Okay, you make a cortex much bigger. Now you think about all those neurons, they're going to try to, they need to project to their targets, right? So they have axons and they're going to the target. If you now have, you know, 10 or 50 times as many neocortex neurons that are all trying to go to their target, well, that target didn't expand in size to keep up with the pace of the input of the cortex. So at some point, the target is going to be full and they have to start going to new targets. I call this connectional imperialism or invasion, or you can have all you can think of all sort of crazy names. I have not been able to test that empirically. There's a fair bit of correlative evidence. One of the things I'm doing in my lab now, I mentioned I work on chicken brains. We're trying to make parts of the chicken brain larger or smaller, and the hope in the long run that we can test test this. But uh, for now, I really just have correlative idea. But one of the nicest examples is this study. Uh, which was looking at the projections from the cortex down to the spinal cord. And if you look in humans, there are a lot of strong projections to most of the spinal cord. And if you just look at the motor neurons here for the, that innervate the hand, the cortical neurons project directly and strongly to those motor neurons that control the hand. Okay, So it's a direct cortical spinal cortical, the motor neurons uh, uh, projections. This was actually a physiological study where they, record, they stimulated in, in the brain areas and then recorded in the motor neurons. Anyway, when you do this in cats, you see that the projection, so here the, the thickness of the red line indicates sort of how strong the projection is. It's a much weaker, the cortical spinal projection is much weaker, and the projection to the motor neurons is not direct. Okay. Uh, again, here they, they stimulated the, this pathway recorded here, and they can see that it's not a not a not a uh, um, direct uh, EPSP. Instead, there are more indirect projections. The blue here are what we call the proprio-spinal circuits. Those are the circuits within the spinal cord, and um, basically, you can think of the the pathways be, having to be more indirect in in the cat. Looking in squirrel monkeys and macaque monkeys, you see as you go to the larger brains you see an increase in the direct projections and a decrease in the indirect projections. Okay, then it's a little tricky always. This looks like some sort of phylogenetic series as you go from cat to monkey to human. But what I'm trying to say is it really has more to do with the proportion of the cortex to the spinal cord and, and, and other areas, that you see an invasion to new targets, the new target in this case being at the motor neurons getting direct input. What does this mean functionally? Uh, the uh, authors here are arguing that this is very nicely correlated with manual dexterity. And I, th I think that's a, that's a pretty good argument. They have measures of manual dexterity. Um, being speculative now, but I think it probably also correlates with things like lingual dexterity. How, 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 how good are you with, with fine movements of your tongue? Probably even laryngeal uh, uh, dexterity. Okay, vocal dexterity in general. Um, I can, there, there's, there's some evidence that only in humans do we have direct projections from the cortex to the motor neurons that innervate your larynx. Uh, in other animals, that's an, a, a less direct projection. So that's all I have on that. Okay? Would love, I'd love to know more about this, but I think it's an interesting uh, uh, idea to think about what are the consequences of having made the neocortex so much larger than the rest of the brain. It probably has some connections it didn't used to have now, but that it's larger, and maybe also has some new inputs, that kind of thing. Of course, neocortex is just one big thing, right? But what if we now look more precisely and, and say, well, what part of the neocortex is most enlarged? 
And there, I think the evidence is pretty clear that it's mainly the prefrontal cortex that is most enlarged. Um, if you here, I've graphed a prefrontal cortex volume versus neocortex. Okay, so and this this line would be if the if the entire prefrontal the entire neocortex was prefrontal, the data points would be along this line. So what you can see is that, first of all, not all of neocortex is prefrontal, but uh, the fact that these all four, this the the slope of this line is greater than one shows that the uh, as you get to larger and larger brains with more neocortex, the prefrontal cortex becomes disproportionately large. Now, evolutionary biologists have argued, like, OK, is this significant, right? Because it's, it's a scaling rule. It's a simple scaling rule. So evolution, natural selection didn't have to do any work uh, to make prefrontal cortex larger, right? It, you, it came along as a ride uh, for making the entire brain larger. Um, but I would argue that maybe, actually, these proportion changes are significant. I mean, maybe natural selection didn't specifically act on that. But there probably was a functional consequence of this shift towards a larger prefrontal cortex. Okay. Now, what was that functional consequence? Right. So then you find yourself looking in the literature and saying, well, what does prefrontal cortex do? And that is, of course, very difficult to answer, partly because the prefrontal cortex has a lot of different parts to it. There's a lateral part, orbital, polar. Here's the medial. That it would include that what I talked about earlier, the anterior cingulate, would be in this area. And they have complex connections with other cortical areas, but also with the striatum. So trying to figure out what the prefrontal cortex does is a really messy thing. I've spent a lot of time with that literature. Uh, and you know, it does a lot, lot of different things that people like to sum up on as executive functions. But then they go, what does that mean? I'm going to take you through one experiment that I like uh, in terms of, because it nicely illustrates, I think, sort of a um, what happened, the, the kinds of deficits you see after prefrontal cortex lesions. So these experiments were done in marmoset monkeys, so relatively small primates. And they were asked to, I'm going to just take you through what these animals, the, the sham lesion ones did. First they were asked to just be given sort of two, two targets, and each target always was a blue polygon, and a red line superimposed on it. And they were just given two, shown two of these, and consistently one of them was rewarded, and then uh, the other one wasn't. So behind it, they could get some sort of food reward. So they very quickly learned this is a stimulus I'm supposed to uh, pay attention to. In particular, I'm supposed to attend the, the, the blue triangles. Okay. Then they were, the animals were given some sort of lesion. In some cases, a sham lesion, which would be your control. So they had the surgery, but they don't actually lesion any brain part. Then they were asked, uh, then the uh, first they tested, do you still remember what you had learned? And then they were asked to do what they call an intradimensional shift. Well, basically, they're still supposed to pay attention to the blue polygons, but now a different blue polygon, no longer the blue triangle, but a different one. Okay, So you're just learning a new. Still paying attention to the same things, but now a new, different thing is rewarded. Then they were doing an extra dimensional shift where they now the blue polygons suddenly become irrelevant and they have to learn no, it's this particular Z shape that you're, of the red lines that you're supposed to pay attention to. And then last, not least, they were supposed to reverse the contingency. So if this had been rewarded before, now suddenly this became rewarded. So the monkeys constantly had to sort of, they had to learn something and then at some point switch where what used to work for them to get rewards didn't work anymore and they had to either, you know, it, it varied basically how, much, how far they had to switch to a different kind of polygon, to a different kind of stimulus or reverse the contingencies. And what you can see here in the, in the diagrams is of course the, 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 the extra dimensional shift and the reversal were harder even for the sham lesion ones. It, it takes a little while to figure out um, uh, that you have to, now pay attention to the red lines or that, uh, the reverse. But these deficits got a lot worse with the lateral uh, and the orbital prefrontal cortex lesions. Uh, we can argue about which, which one is, is, is which and so forth. But the, 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 the main point here I want to make is that what's really consistent theme in the prefrontal cortex literature is that 
it's involved when you have to, when you, what you were doing is no longer working, <laughs> and you have to do something. Okay, so you're monitoring progress and it's not working. And then you have to shift. You have to inhibit what you were doing, and you have to shift to something else, maybe figure out a new kind of rule or, or learn something else. And uh, what, what struck me as I was reading this summer, I was reading Daniel Kahneman's book on thinking fast and slow, and that introduced me to some of the cognitive literature on these dual process theories. And I know that this is just one school of thought within cognitive science, but it struck me that what people are calling sort of thinking by system two, which is conscious, controlled, effortful thinking that's relatively slow, rule-based, sequential, uh, and limited by memory working capacity. That maps on really well on what, onto what the, the prefrontal cortex is doing. The cognitive psychologists, they're very careful never to say that this system is prefrontal cortex. They just want to distinguish the, this system from a more automatic, rapid one. But Having just read that literature on the prefrontal cortex, it's hard for me not to, to see how, uh, the mapping on that. So I would say that the expansion of the, uh, ev uh, of the prefrontal cortex in humans probably expanded our ability to do this kind of thinking as opposed to that kind of thinking, if you uh, want to push it that far. And so this also, the system two kind of thinking, to me also, maps on almost beautifully on what Willis was talking about with the rational soul, that kind of reflective thought, judgment, will. Uh, and so it seems, and I know I'll probably get attacked for this, but it seems kind of, it, you know, almost feel like, okay, I don't want to put the rational soul in the pineal or in the corpus callosum. I want to put it in the prefrontal cortex. I know that is probably, to some extent, simplistic because, like I said, the prefrontal cortex works with all these other areas, um, but it is at least something to say. <laughs> um, now, in the last 10 minutes or so, I uh, want to talk a little bit about um, the downsides, if you will, or the, some of the compromises you, that you encounter when you make the brain larger and larger. One of them is, is this idea that uh, already in humans, probably we have a, you know, birthing is a, is a much more difficult affair in humans, just getting the head through the birth canal, much more difficult than it is, say, in chimpanzees. And, how did humans solve that? Because it probably was a problem uh, for a while. Uh, basically, one way to solve it is to just say, well, we're going to deliver babies prematurely in some sense, right? Before the brain has gotten so big that it can't go through the birth canal. And human brains aren't actually that premature. Most of the brain is, is fairly mature uh, by the time of birth. But the neocortex, and particularly the prefrontal cortex, continues to develop for a long time afterwards. So. Uh, this is, this is not an easy graph to understand, but basically body weight versus brain weight, you can see that uh, after birth, our, our brain continues to grow uh, much uh, uh, more than it does in a chimpanzee. And so that might, you might say, well, that's a downside, right? Because we have this prolonged childhood. There's a lot of long period of investment. You know, you got to wait till the child is 18 before you get, and you have to pay college debt and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, of course, there's an upside too, right? Kids are probably much more impressionable uh, during that period. If they came out and their brains were fully formed, maybe they wouldn't be as impressionable. Maybe they, you know, maybe a lot of our intelligence is actually um, acquired. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to say too much about that. But, uh, kid, kids definitely learn a lot, and it's probably good that they can learn what uh, what is being presented to them in their current environment. Another thing that you might have not thought about so much is this issue of connectivity. So if you imagine a group of neurons where, say, four neurons and every neuron is connected to every other neuron. Now, say you double the number of neurons, you don't just double the connections, right? The number of connections with every doubling of the number of neurons goes up exponentially. And so by the time you have a brain of, say, 100 billion neurons, so someone did that math, uh, said if you had a, a brain of 100 billion neurons, everything connected to everything, and every axon was, say, uh, half a micron thick. How big would that brain be? 20 kilometer sphere in diameter, OK? So uh, probably pretty clear that, that this is not how human brains are connected in the first place, that not everything is connected to everything else. Although if you're not a neuroscientist and you look at some of these diagrams, it sure looks like everything's connected to everything. Uh, 
You can also look at gray matter to white matter scaling, and you realize very quickly that white matter doesn't scale exponentially with gray matter. It scales much more moderately. It does expand a little bit faster than the gray matter. But probably what you have in human brain, uh, in all brains pretty much, is that as, as they scale like this. And as you go to larger number of neurons, the average interconnectivity gets, goes down. Okay, so you can think of this in terms of the degrees of separation problem. The, uh, here, in this kind of circuit, you can very easily get from one neuron to another. Here, you might have a, local clusters of neurons that are tightly interconnected, but to get from this cluster to that cluster, you might have to uh, go further. Now, you might have some shortcuts and, and that kind of thing. Uh, you might have what's called a small world architecture, but still, you would have to, in general, you have more clustering uh, in a larger brain just due to the scaling rule. And that might give you more modularity, if you will, of function. And again, we don't have a lot of <coughs> evidence for that. But um, I think here's one kind of evidence uh, that for greater sort of decreased connectivity leading to functional uh, separation. And that is between the two hemispheres. So most of you know that the two hemispheres are connected through this corpus callosum. And you can take a bunch of mammal brains and uh, sort of bisect them and just measure the area of this. And you can graph the area of the corpus callosum uh, against cortex surface area. And here they actually took a, took a ratio, but it doesn't matter. What you see is that as a in relation to the size of the brain, as you get to the bigger brains, the corpus callosum doesn't keep up. Okay, it goes down. The proportion goes goes down. So what that suggests is that as you go to bigger and bigger brains, the hemispheres don't talk to each other as well. You also have a maybe a problem with conduction delay. You have to go for a longer distance. But just in terms of the number of axons, they're not as tightly interconnected. And you can imagine that at some point you might say, well. If you can't work together because you can't communicate, might as well have you do separate things. Okay? And I think there is a little bit of evidence, at least, that, uh, that large brains, human brains in particular, the, the degree of functional asymmetry is significantly greater than it is in many other animals. And you do have some weird animals, like birds, who do have a lot of asymmetry in their brains. But they don't have a corpus callosum at all. So again, it's actually not a. Um, It's just a different rule, just like I said, primates versus rodents. And birds just play by a different set of rules. And um, so there might be some downsides, right, to, to making brains larger and larger. You might get more and more modules. And I know a lot of people like to say, well, modular organization is great. You know, we can, we can uh, have this area specialized for that, this area specialized for that. And that's true. But you have to have the modules talking to one another. Plus, if one of these modules goes out, you don't have that ability anymore, right? So there might be, as, as you go to larger brains that are more modular, you might have them be more vulnerable. In fact, you know, we are, when we have strokes, even if it's unilateral, it, it can have significant consequences. You try to make a lesion in a rat brain, most of the time, if you do it just on one side, you're not going to see anything. You have to have bilateral lesions to see any kind of effect. All right, so I don't really know if there are going to be any brains, if humans, you know, has human evolution ended? I don't know. Um, but, it, you know, there clearly are counterfactuals, if you will. There are some animals with larger brains. Anyone know what this is? It's a killer whale brain, okay? So it's a nice looking brain. Uh, uh, guess how, how heavy it is? So we have about, what, three pounds, 1.4 kilograms? Just about five kilograms. So these are very large brains. Sperm whale brain is about eight kilograms. So those are big brains. Um, we don't really know how smart whales are. They're probably not as dumb as you might think. Um, I also want to stress that their cortex is a much simpler cortex than ours. So just, you know, it's tempting to say, oh, well, obviously you can make a big brain bigger than ours. You know, they did it. But it's a different brain. Their, their cortex aren't, isn't as big. Uh, their corpus callosum is tiny. In fact, you might have heard that whales and dolphins can sleep with one hemisphere at a time, which is kind of fun. And it has, probably has to do with that reduced corpus callosum. Uh, 
Uh, also, this, this extensive folding is probably just that the cortex is thinner, so you can fold a thin cortex much more tightly than a thick cortex. Anyway, I just want to throw that out there and finish with this. Just to say that uh, this question of how is our brain unique has, has occupied people from Darwin to Huxley for a long time to now. This is actually the frontispiece of, of Huxley's book, uh, where he arranged of different uh, great apes and, and the gibbons. Again, he doubled the size of the gibbon. I don't know why he did that, because he, just, he didn't care about differences in size. Um, and most of you have uh, seen this has been thousand, thousand different varieties. Uh, but um, I wanted to end on a, on a sort of a, a serious note, maybe a little bit, is that why do we care about, you know, you know contemplate our own brain and, and the evolution? What, 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 what is, what's the use of this? Is this purely an academic exercise? And to some extent, surely it is. But I also wonder whether understanding how we are unique, you know, what, what could that be useful for? And I think um, there are basically three areas, I think, that we might be useful. One is uh, if you know how our brains are different, then you, you know where to be careful about extrapolating from non-human research to human research. Uh, I think that's an important factor. Um, second, it might impact animal welfare issues. Uh, um, I am very conflicted about animal welfare. I've taught it, but they're, they're, these are serious issues. You know, uh, is a rat like a boy, uh, as PETA would say, or are they different? Is a, uh, I think that's that's an important question. Um, and third, I think uh, this is something I'm just starting to get interested in. Maybe uh, in and maybe some of you, at being anthropologists, know something about it and can point me in the right direction. Is to ask, well, you know, w w what. A, our brains obviously didn't evolve, evolve in our, for our co current context. So things have changed a lot. And I don't mean necessarily from Stone Age to, to now. I mean, just within the last thousand years, you know, uh, just, you know, iPads and, and all of these things. We're living longer. We have, we're taking lots more medicines. And how do does, how does these things affect us uh, in our current environment? I think those are, those are interesting questions that uh, um, might where comparative psychology, certainly, and maybe even comparative neuro neurobiology have something to contribute. OK, that's about where I want to end. And now uh, we have half an hour for discussion. <laughs> but I need something to drink. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of dying here. Is there water coming? Or? Yeah, so